awesome God. Uh, we're really focusing upon who our Heavenly Father is. Um, just bring up that uh, cartoon. Can you see that? No. Okay. It says, want to see something neat? This is Calvin and Hobbes. Have you guys ever remember Calvin and Hobbes? Yes. Man, I love Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, Calvin uh, and his make-believe uh, friend, his tiger that comes to life when no one else is around. It says, you want to see something... What did that say? Weird. Oh, weird. You want to see something weird? I can't even see it from here. Uh, watch. Watch you put bread in this slot and push down the lever. Then in a few minutes, toast pops up. Wow. Where does the bread go? Beats me. Isn't that weird? <laughs> All right, so, so and I put that up there because, you know, when, when, you, when you look at uh, the young boy and his friend, um, that there's things in their mind that just don't click. It's like, man, where does the bread go? You think about it. Um, and today's message, right, is going to be explaining man, something that's really unexplainable. And most of it's because of our minds, we can't wrap around it. So if we're talking about our awesome God, does anybody have an idea of what we're going to talk about today? The Father, Holy Ghost. The Trinity, right? Man, what a tough topic just to wrap your minds around. Um, the, the title, uh, or excuse me, the, the passage that I've chosen here is in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Um, and it reads thus, it says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your magnificence. Uh, Father, we pray that you would... Help us just to understand more about you so that we can worship you um, the way that you deserve to be worshipped. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So look, this is a doctrine that all Christians believe, but nobody really understands. They can explain it in the way that God is, okay? And, and the tough part is, is that I've got approximately 30 minutes to introduce you to go over some topics about the Trinity that the Christians for ages and thousands of years have been debating and arguing over. So that's something that we, we have. And, and here's the truth, that all Christians believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? Yes. Well, Christian churches across the centuries, as a matter of fact, when the early uh, ecumenical councils met, uh, it worked out to this, is that if you didn't believe in the Trinity, that you were actually a heretic. Right? You were outside of Christian orthodoxy. Um, the thing about the Trinity is that the, it unites the church in proclaiming God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you deny the Trinity, then you find yourself outside of orthodox Christianity. What? <coughs> Christians in general have believed throughout history. Why would we believe this? Well, the Bible teaches the Trinity. Amen. Okay. And, and not only that, but Christians everywhere have always believed it, and, and, and there's no other explanation that makes sense. All right. Um, of course, we go and we stand upon the Word of God, what God has to say, so we're going to look at that. Uh, somebody said this, if you try to explain the Trinity, you will lose your mind. But if you deny it, you will lose your soul. Amen. Right? So it's very important to um, what we believe here. Now, I looked at our, and I didn't bring it with me, I looked at our Constitution, and um, in our Constitution, I read the, what we, our statement of faith, what we believe, and here's somebody, this is another church's, and they say this, we believe in one living and true God who is the creator of heaven and earth, who is eternal, almighty, unchangeable, infinitely powerful, wise, just, and holy. We believe that the one God eternally exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that these three are one God, co-equal, co-eternal, having precisely the same nature and attributes, and worthy of precisely the same worship, confidence, and obedience. 
Did you get all that? There are six statements that break it down just a little bit easier. There's one God and only one. He exists in three persons. They're equal and uh, eternal. They're worthy of equal praise and worship. They're distinct, yet they act in unity, constituting the one true God of the Bible. I'm going to tell you, the early church really struggled over this. And basically they came down to two things, and it says that they are one in essence, but they are active in three persons. So wait, look at the cover of your bulletin. Kind of complicated, isn't it? It really is. When you see that, which is another name we call that is the Godhead, or we talk about the three and one in the Godhead. Now, now there's other religions, I'll say, that profess to be Christian, and they look at us and they say that we actually worship three gods, right? Because one plus one plus one doesn't equal one, it equals three. Well, that's not what we believe. You see, we believe that our one God is three persons in one. And basically, if you want to do it arithmetic, uh, it's one times one times one equals what? One. There you go. Anyway, so that's, that's where we're headed. Okay, if you leave here with a headache trying to understand it, huh, I get it, because it's, it's even harder to try to explain. So let's try to define, or let's explain what the doctrine of the Trinity really is. And sometimes for some of us, right, we learn best in the negative. I know my dogs do. No, 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 don't do that. Get off the couch, get outside. You know, they understand all the negative sides. So here, what we don't believe is this. When you're talking about the Trinity, we don't believe in three gods. That's called tritheism. It's a heresy. Um, we believe in one God. We don't believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three forms of God. All right, there's a doctrine out there that believes that God manifested himself in the Old Testament as the Father of creation. Right? And then in the New Testament, he represented himself as Jesus. And now in the church age, he represents himself as the Holy Spirit. You get that? That's the three, at three different times, God was in three different forms. And we don't believe that. Amen. Okay? Uh, another thing that we don't believe is that in the three, they are all part or pieces of God. Right? The Father is one third God, and Jesus is one third, and then the Holy Spirit, that makes up the whole. No, that's not what we believe either. So it's easy to point out the things that we don't believe and hopefully that we can uh, get to. That's what we don't believe. So well, where do we find this doctrine in the Bible? You see, that becomes, that's where it's important. Let's talk about his unity first. The Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4 says what? The Lord, our God, is what? One. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 we also read where Paul writes that there is no God but one. Second, excuse me, 1 Timothy 2, 5, Paul says there, that he strictly says there that there is only one God. Okay, so now we got the point that there is one God. But there's also a diversity within that unity. In the Old Testament, when you read in the Bible, what, how, does the, how does it start? Genesis 1-1 starts out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so in our English, it just has God. Now, in the Hebrew, it uses the Hebrew word Elohim, which is the plural form of El, God. So, uh oh, what's beginning to go on? Uh, on the screen, you'll see it, Genesis 1, 26 through 27, where God says, says then God said, I can read from here. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds uh, of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. I don't know if you picked up on that, but you can see him underlined, right? How did it start? Then God said, let us make man in our 
image. And then down at the end, he says that God, he created them. Do you see the play on the pronouns? There's a plurality within the Godhead. And even though it doesn't prove Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at this point, it sure does leave room for that to be developed in the New Testament. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 48, 16. In Isaiah 48, 16, it's also up on your screen, it explicitly um, refers to all three persons in the Trinity. Isaiah, writing uh, on the direction of God, he says, draw near to me, hear this. I got the wrong verse up there. Oh, no, I don't. Hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken a secret from the time came to be, I have been there, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Here, here's the truth. Do you think Isaiah back then understood the Trinity? Don't think he did. But he sure did write it. In light of the New Testament, we can see that this is a clear statement of the Trinity in the Old Testament. All three God, uh, excuse me, all three persons. Another thing we can see is that all three persons in the Godhead throughout Scripture are called God. In Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, the Father is called God. In uh, John 20, 28, the Son is called God. Right? If you remember the, the passage where Jesus appeared to doubting Thomas, and Thomas wanted to specifically see his wounds in his hand. What did he say when he put his fingers in the holes and, and, the, and the spot on the side, what did Thomas come out and say? My Lord and my God. Then in Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira came in and lied about something they had done, Paul specifically, or excuse me, uh, Peter specifically says, you have not lied to man, but you have lied to who? The Spirit, who is God. So all three persons in the tree in the Godhead, are called God throughout Scripture. And as we continue on, all three persons are associated together on equal basis. It's what we call a Trinitarian statement. Write these down because they're going to be on your screen. Um, when you look at Jesus' baptism, the passage that we used, Jesus says that when he immediately came up out of the water... The Spirit, as like a dove, descended upon him. And then what did they hear? The voice from God saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So, so, how can they all be one God? Or even if you're talking about the different forms that were there, how can they all appear in one spot? Must be another way to look at it. In 1 Peter 1, 2. According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of His blood. In reference to our salvation, the Godhead all participates. We can see here that Peter even talked about the three. Next passage is 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. When we make disciples of the nations and we are commanded to baptize in Matthew 28, how are we commanded to baptize? In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to prayer, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Give me an amen when you get there. This one's not on the screen. You can't cheat. You got to look it up. 14. And this is a prayer from Paul 
in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, he starts out and he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We can see in this passage that when we talk about prayer, that Paul goes through and he even talks about the whole Godhead being involved in our prayer, in our Christian lives, in the way that we walk and in the things that we, we do. It's tough doctrine to wrap your minds around. How do we have one God in unity but yet three in person? I told you if you tried to explain the doctrine, you'd lose your mind. The last verse that I have up here is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, which reads, But we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruit to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Over and over and over in the Bible, we find these, what they call Trinitarian statements, where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all mentioned in the same context. And let me tell you, if, if the Trinity wasn't true, would that not blaspheme God if you put the Holy Spirit and Jesus on the same level, the same uh, worthiness as God? We have to understand that there's something about our God It's just tough sometimes to understand. So let's look at, let's examine this a little bit more. Uh, the next topic here is the doctrine of the Trinity explained. So let me ask you this question. Where in the Bible do you find the word Trinity? Nowhere. Nowhere, do you? Does that make it not true? You see, because here's the truth. Here's another thing. Where in the Bible do you find the word inerrancy? Speaking about Scripture. It's not in there, but yet it's still a doctrine that we believe because it's taught. And it's the same thing when it comes to uh, the Trinity. We don't believe it because the word is in there. We believe it because the Bible teaches it. How do we illustrate the Trinity? We've all heard kind of some cool little things that, that deal with the Trinity, right? Have you heard about two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen? What is that? Does it, can it not exist in three forms? Well, the thing is, is that they usually don't exist all at the same time and at the same time, so that's kind of a weak thing, but it gives us a, a mind, an idea. Or how about an A? You have the shell, the white, and the yolk. That's another way that people like to describe it. But once I crack the egg and throw the shell away, and in my frying pan, I still have the whites and the yolk. It's still an egg, but yet one piece is missing. So it's kind of falls a little bit short. You can think about uh, the different roles that people play to try to understand the Trinity a little bit. I am a son, I am a father. And I am a husband. The different roles that we play. Look at your bulletin. I think this is one of the best ways to describe the Trinity. And it's a form of a triangle. Right? And in this triangle, it's got God in the center. And at the three different angles, it has the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it says that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, but yet all three are God. Well, let me ask you, if you took one angle away from the triangle, do you still have a triangle? No. It's only whole when it is together. You see, that's the same about our God. They are whole. They are three in one. There's three angles in a triangle. It's just ways for us to try to 
understand a little bit in our mind what the Trinity is really like. Dr. Henry Morris, this is what he writes. He's a famous creation scientist, and this is what he says. He knows that the entire universe is Trinitarian by design. The universe consists of three things, matter, space, and time. Take away any one of those three, and the universe would cease to exist. And not only that, when you look at each of those three um, parts that make up the universe, matter is mass, energy, and motion. Space is length, height, and breadth, and time is past, present, and future. The whole universe witnesses to the character of the God who made it. Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. I think that we can begin to see that just a little bit of how the Trinity is taught in our Bibles, even though we don't see that. And remember the, the, the series that we're looking at is about our awesome God, right? So how do we bring this into application? When we look at the doctrine of the Trinity and apply that, there's a couple things that um, can help us out. You know, children and skeptics always like to ask this question, what was God doing before he created? And I don't know if you've ever heard of Augustine's answer. Uh, he was creating hell for people that asked that question. <laughs> uh, but look, have you ever, uh, in Scripture, it says that the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father, right? You see, what they were doing is that they were together having uh, communion and communication with one another. There was that love relationship between the three before they even created. We could never understand how they did that, but you know, the Bible tells us that they did have that relationship. Francis Schaeffer, who's a philosopher, a Christian philosopher, says that the, uh, says this is where the human desire for intimacy and communication comes from. We were made to communicate. That design is part of the image of God within each one of us. Can't you see that we have an awesome God? The truth of the matter is this is that God is never lonely. He didn't create us because he needed us. He could have kept going the way that he was going, but out of his love, he did. The Trinity sets limits on our speculation about the nature of God. Can, can we just say that there's some things about God that we just won't understand? Right? The Trinity shows us Right, that our understanding isn't complete when we try to think about an infinite and almighty God. The Trinity exalts the Son and the Spirit. Right, because the Father, because He is God, is worshipped. The Son, because He is God, He is worshipped. And the Spirit, because He is God, deserves worship. You figure God is... Uh, Jesus is not just merely the Son of God. He is the second person in our Trinity, God the Son. So that just kind of, here's a, another little application, right? When we pray, how do we pray? Our Father, or dear Heavenly Father, or it goes on like that. But is it okay to pray to Jesus? Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would help me get through. Holy Spirit, I just don't understand what this is saying. Can you reveal? Can you guide me in my life? Do you think that the Godhead, that the Father, the Son, or the Spirit are jealous when you pray to one or the other? No, it doesn't. Yes, and as Christians, we normally, because when Jesus gave us direction to pray, our Father who art in heaven, how would be that name? He gave us direction and teaching on how to pray, but guess what? If you're having trouble understanding a passage of Scripture, who's the one that bears witness? The Spirit that's within us, right? Man, Holy Spirit, I just, I'm having trouble. Can you enlighten me? Holy Spirit, I don't, I don't know what choice to make in this point. Can you please give me guidance, right? We can. There's nothing wrong with that. But not only that, the Trinity really helps us understand what happened upon the cross. You see, when Jesus prayed over and over and over again, he always started out with, Abba, Father. 
But yet when he was upon the cross, he didn't cry out for Abba Father. Who did he cry out to? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, it's at this point in time we can understand that when the sin of the world, when the wrath of God was being poured out upon Jesus upon the cross, and God had to punish that sin because he couldn't look upon it. He actually turned his back upon the sun. The world went dark, right? You see, this is the agony that Jesus went through, is the separation between him and the Father at this point in time. He knew that that was coming. It, it wasn't the beating that he took that he was so worried about. It was the separation from the Father. It was bearing the wrath that, uh, that God has towards sin. And we begin to understand just a, a little bit more. The eternal Son cries out to the Father at the moment when that penalty has been laid. And that's the way that we can say, well, how can one man bear the sin of the entire world? One man couldn't, but the God-man could. Only an infinite God could bear the sins of the world. Daniel Webster, who was a devout Christian. Do we know who he is? Webster's Dictionary? Okay. Somebody asked him one time, how can a man of your intellect believe in the Trinity? And what he said is this, is, I do not pretend to fully understand the arithmetic of heaven now. You see, there's some things, folks, that we just... We're not going to come to that full understanding, but we accept it on faith because the Bible teaches it over and over and over. It talks about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in one passage. There's a passage of Deuteronomy. I didn't look it up, but I should have. And it says that the secret things are left to God. Right? And all it is for us is to accept. Think about it. When it comes to God and the parts that we cannot and not understand about Him, it just lets us bow and worship more fully because of who He really is. God, I may not understand this part of You, but I worship You because I know that You are God. When people talk about Jesus in the old, or even in the world today, and they begin to question who Jesus is. Well, how did he perform his miracles? How did he walk on water? How did he feed the 5,000? Let me tell you, when you go back and you say that Jesus is God, all those other things oh, become understandable. But there's just some truths. And you must understand that when we were so lost in sin that God acted in every person in the Trinity to find us and to save us. Jesus says, I come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Bible tells us that the Father gave His Son. And the Holy Spirit is the one that brings us to Jesus. Isn't that an awesome God? Amen. And it just leads us to the point where we can just bow in adoration and say, I may not understand it, God, but I worship you. For you are above my little mind. I can understand a lot of things, but how God operates in three and one, sometimes it's tough. But it brings us to the point that when we look at our awesome God, we can just fall in worship for who he is. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are. God, we may not be able to wrap our minds fully around the truth of the Godhead and how it all works out and how you communicated and what you were doing before you created us. We will leave those secret things to you, but we will worship you for who you are. Father, help us to understand just a little bit more about yourself as we come to know you better and better as our awesome God. In Jesus' name, amen.